welcome to another episode of Making It with Chris G, where we have conversations with people in the world of entertainment who are making it from behind the scenes to the spotlight, sharing their stories and insight to help you get one step closer to making it. Thank you all so much for listening and coming back. If this is your first time, we're very happy that you're listening and that you're here. Happy to have you. Thanks for all the support and love and all the positivity. We got a lot of love for all 18 episodes so far, but the last five have been some heavy hitters. With round two of the Greg Roulette interview, the two episodes with Kevin Stone, Ari Herstan, and the leadoff conversation of our New Orleans series with Mr. Eric Green. Last week was our record week so far of downloads. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate all the support. Couldn't do that without you guys listening, downloading, sharing the episodes, leaving five-star reviews. Really, really appreciative. So I just want to say thank you for making this podcast grow and bringing new listeners on every week. And speaking of the Eric Green interview of the New Orleans series, the New Orleans series continues today with Mr. Ivan Neville of Dumpster Funk. And we're talking about their brand new single, Justice, which is out now. We're currently in week two of the five-week series featuring special guests from New Orleans. And we kicked it off last week with my good friend Eric Green, who's the marketing manager for a big promotions company called Hookah Entertainment, who promotes shows, over 200 shows all over the Southeast. They put on Pemberton Festival. They put on the Buku Music and Arts Project, and Tortuga Festival in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So a lot of awesome things that they do. Eric Green is the marketing manager there. As I said, he was also the marketing coordinator at House of Blues in New Orleans. He had a lot of great insight and things to share, such as how to stand out in an internship, how to not just be the person that's getting coffee and shredding paper, right? How do you stand out? How do you take your internship and turn it into a job. He talks about the transition of House of Blues being bought by Live Nation. He was there when that was happening. The introduction of social media to promoting shows. When he started, we didn't use social media to promote shows yet. There weren't any really rules on how to utilize social media platforms. And he also talks about building markets. They would go into the cities and build a music scene in cities, building a fan base for artists and so much more. I really want to encourage you guys to check that episode out. It was a really great and fun interview. All the show notes for that episode and every single episode are available on makingitwithchrisg.com. The website is finally live. It's been there for a few weeks now. So check it out. A lot of great information there for you guys. All the links to all the episodes are there. All the links to the social media sites for us and for for me so make sure to stop by keep in touch reach out let us know what you would like to hear what kinds of interviews you would like to hear what types of careers you'd like to see featured don't want to do just like the the big the big stars also want trying to get the great behind the scenes stories the stars behind the scenes such as eric green and it was such an awesome interview and you know while you check that out in this episode please take a quick second stop by itunes Give us a review. Hopefully it's a five-star review. Hopefully you're enjoying what you're hearing. You're getting some great information and great insight that you can apply to your career. Hopefully it's just it's just entertaining and you enjoy the stories because some of these guests have a lot of great stories and they're just really fun to listen to. So leave those reviews. We appreciate all the support and couldn't do this without every single one of you. So please keep in touch. Reach out on Twitter and Instagram. That's where I hang out the most. Or you can reach me on email. It's all on the website, making it with Chris G.com. So let's go on to today's conversation with Ivan Neville of Dumpster Funk. He's also the son of Aaron Neville, and with that, was born into a musical family in New Orleans, Louisiana, and grew up playing with the Neville brothers and many other of the amazing musicians from New Orleans. He had his first Billboard Top 30 hit in 1988 with Not Just Another Girl from his debut album. If My Ancestors Could See Me Now. On that same album, he had another top 100 hit with Bonnie Raitt. He contributed keyboards on two of Rolling Stone's album, The Rolling Stones, as well as Keith Richards' side project. He was on tour as a a touring member of the Spin Doctors. Ivan has also contributed to the albums of Don Henley, Paula Abdul, Bonnie Raitt, and so many more. 
In 2003, he formed the New Orleans powerhouse funk band Dumpster Funk, one of my favorite artists. And Rolling Stone said Dumpster Funk has grown from a small side project into one of New Orleans' most prestigious modern funk ensembles. Really want to encourage you guys to check them out. Dumpster Funk has performed on some of the world's largest festivals, such as New Orleans Jazz Fest, Bonnaroo, Hangout Fest, High Sierra, and so many more. They have a brand new single out this week called Justice, which came out the week of January 16, 2016, in case you guys are listening to this in the future. It's also available on dumpstafunk.com. That's spelled D-U-M-P-S-T-A-P-H-U-N-K.com. The Funk. And while you're there, check out their tour dates. They're incredible live. If they're coming to a town near you, I really want to encourage you to see them live. I had the, the honor while I was at the Plaza Live down in Orlando to book them several times and also see them live while, while I was in New Orleans. And they're absolutely incredible. Such a good live show. So much fun. Get crazy and dance with Dumps the Funk. I feel like I could have gone on for, for a three-hour-long episode with with this guy, with the experience and the history that he has. Maybe we'll do a, a longer round two down the road if y'all are listening. So we'll love to do it again. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ivan Neville of Dumpster Funk. I'm very excited to introduce you guys to Mr. Ivan Neville. Hey, Ivan, welcome to the show. How you doing? Doing great. I'm excited to be here in New Orleans. Good to be here. It's a great place to be. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you're originally from, from New Orleans? Born and raised. Yes. 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 Awesome. Man. So New Orleans is real popular for their great music, such as Dumps the Funk good and Ivan Neville. Good yeah, food. Good music, good food, good people. Yeah. yeah. So for, for anybody that's coming to town for the first time, what would, what is Ivan Neville's recommendations of the must-go-to restaurants, venues, and hidden gems must of New Orleans? Must-go-to restaurants... Usually music is involved, kind of kind of goes hand in hand. Well, there's one place in particular that is a club called the Maple Leaf. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you know, old school joint. Um, lots of local local talent play there pretty much every night of the week. Mm-hmm. And there's a restaurant right next door called Jockeymo's. Oh, I love that place. And that's like, it's an, it's an indulgence, you know. It's like if you got to be ready to, you know, you can't be like on a diet. Or yeah. <laughs> going there. So, and it's, it's good. It's a great, a best of all kind of New Orleans flavors, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a few other places that I really like. Um, there's a place called Pesh. Mm-hmm. If you like seafood, very big on seafood. They got other dishes that are very that are great there. That's in the in the CBD mm-hmm. down there. Pesh, P-E-C-H-E. Okay. Fish. 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 <laughs> there you go. Good stuff. Um, and then there's a, you know what, there's a place, I, w- I would tell a lot of people that come into town that want to go somewhere that's good, that, that serves like some some basic New Orleans kind of stuff. And there's a place that local people would, we would go to, mm-hmm. and it's, in, it's called Mandinas. Mandinas? Okay. Mandinas. And it's a very good, on Canal Street, very good. And obviously the music venues, like I said, the Maple Leaf's a great place. Tipitina's. There's a legendary place to go and see live music on Chapatula's and Napoleon mm-hmm. Street on the corner. We we cut our teeth playing there yeah. as as youngsters, and the place is, is is around going strong right now. And we play there, you know, every every so often. We close out Jazz Fest last night of Jazz Fest. Our band Dumpster Fall mm-hmm. plays there at Tipitina's. Oh, very nice. That last Sunday night. That's the place to be. How long have you guys been doing that? We've been doing that for about, I don't know, seven, eight years, something okay. like that. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So as of the recording, recording this the day before New Year's Eve, but we're going to release it on January 19th, and you have something really exciting happening the following day. You have a brand new single coming out called Justice. Justice, and it's also, it's just like, it's a, that's like around Martin Luther King's birthday. Mm-hmm. When, when is that? What? It's that Monday before. That's close by as well. Tell me about Justice, because you have Trump on Shorty on the album. How did that? Troy played on it. Look, yeah, you know, cool. Troy kind of, we, we, you know, we, we knew, we've, we've known Troy since he was, was, a, was a, young, a youngster playing, mm-hmm. playing around. And he used to sit in with the Neville brothers back in the days, and uh, he was always hanging around. Um, Cyril Cyril had a had a had a, kin, a, a a thing where he he would always kind of mentor like the young the young have the youngsters, and there was a lot of um, there was a thing called the Jazz Babies, and there mm-hmm. was a lot of young cats that were playing. I mean, young like I'm talking fourteen. 
13, 14 years old, mm -hmm. things, uh, cats that age were playing um, uh, aspiring musicians. And obviously, Troy, we always knew that he was the one, right? you know, uh, most likely to, to do great things. Mm -hmm. And sure. he has. Um, and, you know, we kind of got a thing. I got a thing going with him where we, you know, I play on your stuff, you play on my stuff kind of mm -hmm. thing. So we got him to play on The Justice. Very cool. Um, and he's played on several of our re our, our recordings, mm -hmm. but it's, it was special to get him on on Justice, get a little flavor, get a little trombone on there. Yeah, it's a really good tune. Yeah. I, I love the the music it, video you guys. And there is a too. version also with Ch Charlie Tuna. Okay, does a rap on one on. I don't know whether we're going to put that on the main version mm -hmm. or it's going to be on one of the remixed versions. But there are several versions of the song Justice that you might hear. So. Well, it's a really good song, really catchy, so I can't wait for to see what people think about it and yeah, share man, it with the, yeah, the students uh, at Full Sail. Us as well, us as well. Yeah. So yeah, another exciting thing happened on, on Halloween night. You had uh, Bob Weir from one of the founding members of the Grateful Dead join you guys on stage. Yeah, yeah, we played up there at, 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 uh, in, uh, up in Mill Valley at the Sweetwater uh, little, little place. They, they um, kind of refurbished. They, they, it's it's, an, it's a, uh, Sweetwater was a little, was a little club, a little, little kind of a dive bar slash uh, cool hang for musicians in the mm -hmm. Bay Area would always hang out. And that place had kind of died down. And Bob, Bobby Weir, along with uh, a, a couple of other people, they re-invigorated re, re, um, that whole oh, cool. situation. They redid the place, um, put a nice uh, system in it. Mm -hmm. It's a great little room. Yeah. Um, I think it holds about maybe 400 people. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a really good, good size. It's, it's a good, 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 good little room. And, um, and Bob Weir is like, he's one of the partners in that place and we just happened to play he happened to be around and he you know showed up and played a little bit with us That's awesome. that night it was great what Halloween. Kind of, what kind of stuff did you guys play together we played a few dead songs and a few other little things some new orleans -y kind of stuff mm -hmm. and because i mean they they've always liked uh been fans mm -hmm. of the new orleans music you know they they used to uh, they were they were known for doing um a version of ico okay the, the, the Grateful Dead, uh, they, they've known, they, they've, they've um, covered that song uh, uh, probably uh, numerous times over the course of their, you know, live performing and whatnot. So that, you know, we we, we did a little Ico, and we did some Dead songs. Okay. We did a Shakedown Street, um, and then I, some other stuff that I don't, I don't really know what to do. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I don't really, I don't remember what, we did at least one or two songs. I had no idea what the songs were. <laughs> I was just following along. Yeah, wherever the music I, carries that's you. That's cool when you do stuff like that. It's you know, absolutely. A little spontaneity going on. and The fans love that. And it brings great stories. You know, uh, ain't nothing like it. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And then uh, speaking of great collaborations, tomorrow night you have a massive New Year's Eve show with the Foundation of Funk featuring George Porter and Zig from the from the Meters yeah, and Eddie yeah. Roberts from New Master Sounds. Yeah, you, you, we Dumpsters playing and then the Foundation of Funk. Foundation of Funk, which is pretty much George and Zig. Mm -hmm. And they and they um have a couple of other uh, people join join with them, uh and and they play you know some meterish meteresque kind of <laughs> stuff. I mean, and those guys can do it. You know, can't nobody do it like them. So yeah, it should be fun, fun time tomorrow night. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, whoever's listening to us now, hopefully they had the chance to. To Check see that, that show because yeah, that right? was going to be a great yeah. one. Jazz Fest is a is a huge deal in New Orleans, and of course, you guys close out tips on, on Jazz Fest every year uh, for the last seven years. Yes. What is your favorite Jazz Fest memories? Oh man, there's so many of them. I don't know, <laughs> man. I got a, lot, got a lot of them. Um, probably too many to really pick one. This is the first one that comes to mind. Oh, I I would. You know what? Probably my favorite one is probably the first time I played there. And that was, I ain't going to tell you what year it was, but it was a long <laughs> time ago. And I was performing as part of the, the brothers' first, um, it was actually, the, the, the band was billed as the Wild Chopper Toolers. Okay. And it was the four Neville brothers along with my great uncle, George Landry, Big Chief Jolly of the Wild Chopper Toolers. Mm -hmm. And I was along for the ride. And That's I awesome. was just up there singing along with them. And we were doing the Wild Chopper Tula's um, mm. repertoire, which, was, which is a great, a great group of songs. And that was, to me, unofficially, that was the first Neville Brothers performance at the Jazz Fest. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So, I mean, speak, so speaking of the Nevilles, 
you grew up surrounded by music in a very talented musical family. What was that like growing up in that kind of lifestyle? It was pretty cool, you know, seeing some of the things uh, that I got. I was fortunate enough to to, to witness um, hanging out with my dad, going to some some recording sessions at the studio. The uh, the uh, Cosmo Cosmo Matassa, who was um. Mm-hmm. Who was a who was a who was a, he, a hero of New Orleans music and a, an engineer producer who uh, who had that studio and um a lot, I was I was fortunate enough to go over there with my dad when I was a kid and see a lot of stuff I uh, saw Alan Toussaint hanging around mm, doing nice. what he and he was another great one who's, mm, who's contributed uh, immensely to New Orleans the culture uh, and the the, the the legacy of New, what, what is New Orleans music um. Growing up, seeing stuff like that, and seeing the meters, and seeing a drum kit set up in my in our living room, mm-hmm. and uh, Zigaboo's drum kit, I, I believe it was, or maybe it was Cyril's drum kit. Right. And both of those guys would come over here and there, and sit down at the kit and play the drum kit, and and just this all the music that was going on around, you know, and it was pretty fun times, you know. Yeah. yeah. Outside of the family, who are some of your musical influences? Um, I like to listen to a lot of stuff as a kid. I listened to um, the Jackson Five. Oh, yeah. Obviously, that was some of the first stuff that really got me. The Beatles. When I looked, the Beatles was actually the first thing I really paid attention yeah. to. I paid, and then I, I, and then soon thereafter, a few years later, the Jackson Five came along when I was maybe nine, ten years old. And and and, do, and in between all that, I I had, I had stumbled up on. Some Sly and the Family Stone. Oh, yeah. And cool. there was records all always around. There was always records and some sort of record player to play records. Um, and that was kind of the deal. You, you you sit around and you're doing nothing and you're looking at a stack of records. Hmm. And we, you, would, you, you would explore that. You would play some records and you'd say, oh, what's that? Oh. And you'd read the label. You'd read the record uh, and see, you know, and between uh, that stuff and, and the stuff that was going on locally and the meters were making records doing that during that same period, I'm talking about late, uh, mid to late 60s to, to early 70s okay. to mid 70s. Uh, uh, through that whole era mm-hmm. was when music really hit me hard. You know, it was uh, some good stuff coming out and not just locally. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, my dad and them were doing what they were doing. My dad had a major hit song in 1966, a song called Tell It Like It Is. Mm-hmm. It was a great song. I think it made it to like number two yeah, on yeah. the charts and... And then the meters were making their records, and they had the sissy strut and chicken strut and all that stuff. And then you had all the other stuff that was playing on the radio. Um, I mean, let alone the local stuff like King Floyd and mm-hmm. and uh, Lee Dorsey and and all that stuff. And um, and then you got the Sly and the Family Stone that that I th- I thought Sly and the Family Stone that really hit me because I thought it was a um, it was a it was a multi. Um, Multi, it was a multiracial, uh, and also um, there were females and males in the band. There were like women and men mm-hmm. together, white, black. Yeah, it was a, a, a mixture that I had not really seen up to that point, and mm-hmm. uh, and that that kind of hit me. And then when I heard the music they were playing, it was like some, it was like some funky funk kind of <laughs> rock and roll bluesy. I can't can't even describe really what right. it. What it really is, gospel. Very different sound. It was a nice mixture of many things. And that really hit me hard. And that um, stayed stuck with me a lot, you know. Tell me about the the first time you picked up an instrument. You had so many influences. Somewhere around that time, um, I would say when I was around 9 or 10 years old, I picked Mm -hmm. up a guitar. Okay. And I would play a couple of little lines. I learned a couple of lines, like some Sly and the Family Stone. Nice. Sim- sing a simple song, that line there, that line there, and, and a couple of Jackson 5 little lines. Nice. And I played that for just a minute, and I, and I kind of, I didn't I really have to have the patience at the time as a kid. <laughs> I wanted to go outside and play football right. and stuff like that and run the streets. And so I put the guitar down, and I didn't, I didn't start playing another instrument until... I was about 15 years oh, really? old, and I started playing piano. Okay. And there was a guy by the name of James Booker, who I think is probably the greatest piano player out of New Orleans. And there's many great piano yeah, players out of absolutely. New Orleans. And you're talking, 
you know, you're talking my Uncle Art, you're talking Alan Toussaint, mm -hmm. Dr. John, Professor Longhair, Toots Washington, um, to name a few. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And James Booker, to me, was the most amazing uh, piano player that I had heard. Mm -hmm. And he was really close to our family. He had went to grade school with my dad and went to high school with my mom. So he was a frequent visitor to our house. Mm -hmm. Every so often, he'd just pop up. And we always had a piano in our house, and he would sit down and play. Oh, and cool. Totally uh, dazzle. I would be totally mesmerized. He'd teach you something. watching him play. He taught me how to play Big Chief, which is a Professor Longhair song. Oh, nice. Which is a cool thing. I mean, Big Chief, the funny thing is every New Orleans piano player, you kind of got to know how to play Big Chief. Yeah. If you don't know how to play Big Chief, you got to you gotta know. You need, yeah, yeah. To, you need to know how to it's play that. <laughs> but the funny thing is nobody plays it exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's slightly different little nuances that go along with playing that song. And like Dr. John plays it his own way. Alan Toussaint played it his way. Art plays it a certain way. Now, Professor Longhair, he was the originator. Right. And he played it his way. Now, Booker taught me how to play it. Mm -hmm. And he played it slightly different from all of the others. And, then you and I kind of incorporated. Now, over the years, I've kind of incorporated a few different versions. Oh, cool. Into what I into what I do it. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. It's a real yeah, cool story. Yeah. And what is the transition from when you started playing piano to when you started performing live? And how does it was pretty soon after. I mean, I started. I immediately, as soon as I started listening to songs, listening to the radio, and I learned like that. I listened listen to songs um, by ear. I would copy them from mm -hmm. the radio, and then my dad taught me a few songs, mm -hmm. and I knew a few. Like Cabbage Alley by the Meters, that was one of the early songs that I knew. I think Cabbage Alley might have been the first actual song that I was taught by okay. my dad, and the first one I pl kind of played. And um, I, I started pl uh, playing. I did a couple of gigs with my dad, like mm -hmm. on the side, little little. He, I mean, I'm, I mean, I remember him paying me like a hundred bucks. Oh like, yeah, wow, <laughs> well, that's a gig. Yeah, <laughs> I was excited. I, I soon started playing with the brothers. Like maybe okay. I had been playing for maybe a couple of years because I started my own group, and gradually I started. I would sit in with the Neville brothers, and then I would go out and I would mask as an Indian and put on an Indian costume, right. and like the Mardi Gras mm -hmm. Indians, I would do that. And then I started sitting and playing a little keyboards, and then gradually I just became a member of that band. Oh, cool. And I'm talking like maybe fresh out of high school, maybe yeah. 19, like 1979, something like that. Mm -hmm. What yeah. is the, the story? Because I, I don't even know. What's the story behind the, the Mardi Gras Indians for people that well, don't know? Well, Mardi Gras Indians, as far as, I mean, I, I don't, I, I know from what I've heard, and basically um, Mardi Gras was um, uh, main, main, mostly celebrated. It was mostly, um, it was mostly a, a, white, a white thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the black people were limited to their participation in Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have this one parade, it's called the Zulu Parade, and that's the black parade. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's, uh, other than that, uh, you know, uh, we didn't, uh, African Americans didn't have a huge participation in, in the Mardi Gras um, and Mardi Gras Indians was something that was, um, I think it kind of was, was, was um, started like back in the days, like back in the slavery days, where some slaves mingled with some, with some Native Americans. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then it became a thing where only on Sundays, uh, 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 blacks were allowed to go to this certain spot called Congo Square, which is where... Mm -hmm. um, the municipal auditorium in Louis Armstrong Park, Armstrong okay. Park. Yeah, yeah. that was the area. That was like a, a, a congregation spot. Mm -hmm. And uh, people, they were allowed to go there and hang out and play. I guess they played drums and whatnot, and they mingled with some Indians. And that, that um, in turn, that culture was passed on. Uh, the Indian culture mm -hmm. was kind of shared with, with, with the African Americans and the, the blacks. And uh, we um, took that and, and, and started doing... Uh, basically, Mardi Gras, uh, 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 black people started masking as Indians oh, wow. on, on Mardi Gras. That's cool. And that was our participation in the Mardi Gras. And then guys, they started forming tribes, like mm -hmm. from the different neighborhoods. You got working class guys that are male men or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. or whatever they might be, or garbage men or, uh, uh, from all walks of life. And these guys would would, would uh, save up money and fix up these elaborate 
costumes. Very colorful, beautiful. Plumes, ostrich plumes and whatnot and rhinestones and make these um these 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 elaborate Indian costumes. Now back in the days, they used to kind of fight a little bit, you know, and yeah. they would fight. It was kind of dangerous. Right. But then it became the competition started being about the beauty of the of the suit. Right. Who had the prettiest um, Indian suit yeah. on? So that's that's been a tradition that's that's grown and and and, and lived str- lived strong over the years. Mm. And it's a great thing that's still around uh, to this day. Yeah, it's a real beautiful and tradition. it's an amazing part of Mardi Gras. If you've been to Mardi Gras and you've never seen a Mardi Gras Indian, you're missing out on you a gotta lot. you got to go to Congo a Square. big part of what Mardi Gras is in New Orleans. Right, so speaking of Mardi Gras, I mean, most people think it's, you know, beads and Bourbon Street when there's well, so that, much that's more. that's part of it. That's part of it. There's, there's so much more so beauty much to more it. to go to it. Yeah. Like, if you happen to go, you got to go... You go to Second and Drive right. Street, and, uh, and you'll What's see some second Indians. End? Second Street, Second and Drive. Okay, it's, it's a corner. Okay, Second Street and Drive Street, and that's an uh, uh, an intersection where the Indians always. That's a famous little area, and there's also Claiborne and Saint Bernard down okay. there, because you got the downtown Indians, you mm-hmm. got the uptown Indians, mm-hmm. and you're gonna see some Indians off the beaten path of the normalcy of the parade right. routes. And obviously, you said the parades, the parades in the French Quarter and mm-hmm. Bourbon Street. Yeah, yeah. You got all that. But if you go off the beaten path a little bit, you might see something. They say, oh, what, what's all those people doing over there? Yeah. And there's, there's the street's blocked off. I can't go any further. What's going right. on? You look out your car, and then you see these beautiful uh, costumes, of Indian, these feathers, and mm-hmm. you see these people dressed up in, in, these, in, this, in this Indian outfits, you right, know, yeah, with, yeah. with everything. With I'm going to have to put a picture of it in the, in the show notes so um, people see. And something to see, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a big part of, of, of who the Neville Brothers, because the Neville Brothers kind of formed, basically, um, my great uncle Jolly mm-hmm. was, was, in, was integral, was a, very important in the Neville Brothers becoming a band. Mm-hmm. And they were influenced heavily by, by okay. him. And he masked, masked Indian. Oh, wow. And he was, mm-hmm. uh, he was known as Big Chief Jolly. And he okay. had his big tribe called the Wild Chopper Tools. Is that tri- tribe still around? The watch opportunities are still around, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I have to put some some info on that in the show notes for So that everybody. mixture, all of that stuff and all the, the, the rhythms from that and the, the Caribbean influences and from you know, from down in the Caribbean and Haiti and the and in other parts uh, uh it all mixed in with this music, this mm-hmm. New Orleans music. Now I heard I heard that in Jamaica, I heard that they would get some sort of um feed of New Orleans radio stations oh, yeah? down there. And they would hear some New Orleans rhythms. Oh, wow. So some of that stuff influenced some reggae. Some of the reggae music, yeah. And then in turn, that same music influenced Influ- what was going on here. That's so, so cool. It's cool how, you like, got like music influencing each other. exchange going yeah. on here, you know. So, so there's, I know we don't have a lot of time, and there's so many different directions we could go. Let's talk about the song Justice. Okay. So, I mean, obviously there's a lot of injustice. Mm-hmm. Um in many, many forms. Um, I mean, obviously we see it. It's been going on a lot longer than we know Mm -hmm. and maybe a lot longer than we'd like to admit. But these kind of things have been going on for lots of years where minorities, blacks, African-American people have been subjected to um, being typecast and being um, profiled Mm -hmm. by policemen and, and whatnot. And... There have been some awful incidents that have mm-hmm. happened, and and I and I guess in recent history, when the little kid got killed by the guy mm-hmm. in Florida, when Trayvon Martin oh, yeah, yeah. got killed, and then the guy was found some stand your ground thing, and I'm like, oh wow, what? This is not fair. That right. kid, because he has a hood on, he gets killed, and this guy gets away with killing this guy, this kid, because. He said he was scared. Right. I don't understand that. So child. Now, now you got police officers who are killing people, and they say their life was in danger. Mm-hmm. You got, I mean, and some of the most of these people have seemingly been unarmed. Right. So how you have a gun, you have everything, you got all that stuff, and you you're in fear of your life, and you're going to kill. And so you, you, a lot of these people get away with killing people. Not. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure there's some instances where maybe somebody did something to provoke someone. That's possible. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it can't, People are too quick, though, to pull the No, gun, you're yeah. too quick to judge and too quick to assume. And it's just, it's just too... The numbers, the numbers just make it um, obvious that something's wrong. Right. Something's wrong with our system. Something's wrong where 
innocent people can get killed mm -hmm. with no provocation. Yeah. And this and many other aspects of being, you know, if you and now you got you got a guy that's um, the president elect, which I, I can't I can't even say his name in that president elect in the same sentence, <laughs> because my opinion, my I mean, from, I mean, I, I don't want to get into that, but I mean. You know, it's, when you grow up and you see people who are presidents and become the president of the United States, and you've had different um, different people with different opinions run, being the, in charge of this country, but this is a whole new ball game that's going on right. right now. This is a guy that has no experience, and to me, the idea when you were a kid, oh, you can be anything you want. You can be the president of the United States. Right. Now, this guy right now, he set a new low. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have to be that bright right. or smart. I mean, you got to take a drive. You got to take a uh, test to get a driver's license. Right. You don't have to take some sort of test to be the president. Right. This guy can't spell. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I, my opinion is my opinion, but I mean, black and white is black and white. Right. And I want to be optimistic and hopefully, um, like uh, President Obama said, uh, this, this we zigzagged a lot, mm -hmm. and we do. We go up and down, and we go this way and that way, and. Republican, Democrat, whatever, but we're one nation. We're right. one nation, and we mm. need to, that's what we need to realize, that mm. we're one nation. Now, hopefully this guy can can do some good things. Hopefully somebody can talk something, in uh, some some good sense into right. him to make some good decisions about that. I don't know. That's neither, I don't have any control over it, but you know what? But we do we do have a voice to say say things. Yeah. And this song, Justice, is about, um, is about, what we talked about, about the police injustice, mm -hmm. the violence, obviously uh, people killing uh, in, in our neighborhoods, people killing one another right. is, is awful, you mm -hmm. know. Um, women being subjected to excessive uh, uh, violence and, and domestic things that happen, mm -hmm. all of that. You got, and then you got people that, the, that come over here from other parts of the world are now being subjected to be, being possibly typecast and, right. and whatnot and looked at as, as different. It, it, it doesn't make any sense, right. you know. It, I thought that when we were, when we were growing up, when I was growing up, you know, people had different beliefs. You had you had different religions. You right. got people who are Catholic, people who are Protestant, people who are Presbyterian, whatever, Methodist, right. and all that. And every we still played in the same playground, mm -hmm. and we all went to some same schools. Mm -hmm. But it, now it seems like you, when you think things are getting better, we're as more we're, we're as divided now than I've ever re realized that yeah. we were that totally we agree. could be. And now we have a whole uh, separate thing going on right now, and especially with the division that happened with the last with the election. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this song "Justice," uh, we hope we hope that um, people can hear a little message in it and would, would take from it what, what they want. And there's some specific lyrics mm -hmm. that you can hear, and you hear what we're talking about. But the system, the system's messed up. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, love wins out over hate. Right. And totally that's agree. and then that's it, you know. And you, then, you have a you have a lot of you know a wide range of fans, but a lot of young fans too. Yeah. What is something you would like to see make less of a divide between? Well, the basically, we have to be involved. I mean, mm -hmm. everybody's got access to social media now. Everybody's mm -hmm. got an iPhone. Everybody's right. got some sort of link to look at everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. So that we should use that to our advantage mm -hmm. and be involved. You can say sit on the sidelines and say and make a comment on the Facebook, right. but did you vote right. to 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 help the the outcome mm -hmm. of the election or whatever, or vote. vote for your local politicians and your congressmen mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Yeah. You have a voice. Use it. I mean, you could go on the Facebook and say all you want, or go on Instagram and everywhere else, and that stuff's cool. Mm -hmm. But let's use our voices and our opinions and and and, and our thoughts. Use it to to maybe make make a difference and make some changes. Yeah, you got to sh show up every election, not just the presidential up. election. That's not. I mean, that's what I think is missing. Because mm -hmm. we talk a lot and we say a lot, right? And you we read a lot on the internet and on the <laughs> social media, but mm -hmm. we need to um, make our make our opinions and our voices heard a little mm -hmm. louder. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I mean, to spread love more, spread love wins out over hate. Yeah. You know. I mean, it, it just does. Mm -hmm. And you can't buy into to, to that, to the negativity. You can't let it rule you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the election had a huge impact on, you know, I'm from I'm living in Orlando, and with all the, the tragedies that happened in Orlando. Right, oh, man, that's, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it, totally insane, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. you got a whole uh, a bunch of people, and, and 
You got, you know, the homophobia and mm -hmm. all of that. It's, it's just, it's, it's just insane. Yeah. You know that people need to be able to be, be, be themselves, and and no matter what your race, your 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 um, you know, your sexual orientation, your 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 your, your gender, all of that. You, you should be able to just be. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be the land of the free. Right. Yeah. You know, and turns out it's not that simple. Well, I love that you're the message that you're trying to put out with this song and trying to put out a positive message and trying yeah. to encourage people to come together. That's so important. We need a lot more of that. So I want to yes, commend sir. you for, for, for doing that. It's really cool. I want to just name a couple of names real quick and just want to have, have you maybe tell me the first thing that comes to mind. It can be okay. a story. It can be just one word, uh, whatever comes to mind. So okay. and these are some names of people that you've worked with throughout your career. Right. So Bonnie Raitt. Beautiful. Mama. Awesome. Uh, Keith Richards. Big brother. Uh, spin Doctors. My friends, man, they helped, they helped me out a great deal, those guys. Mm -hmm. I was kind of, when I was playing with the Spin Doctors, I was kind of in a dark phase of my life, and I was kind of on a down, downward spiral. And mm -hmm. I was, those guys um, helped me out a great deal. Yeah. And then uh, Fats Domino. New Orleans Royalty. And Trumbon Shorty. Prince of New Orleans. <laughs> Paul Abdul. <laughs> Paul <laughs> Abdul. Um, Laker cheerleader. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Annie DeFranco. Oh, man. Annie DeFranco. Oh, man. <laughs> brave, brave, strong. She got balls. <laughs> <laughs> and then a uh, rebirth brass band. Carries of the torch. And then the uh, last one, George Porter. George Porter Jr. Uncle George. Funky. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the bass man from the meters, uh, what can you say? I mean, I, he, George has taught me a tremendous, a huge, huge, uh, uh, I mean, I owe George, I can't describe in words what he's, what, how he's helped me over the years and mm -hmm. how he's inspired me, how he's made me help, help my confidence mm -hmm. by, him, by him looking at me with the respect that he's shown me over the years. Right. I greatly appreciate George Porter. Very cool. There's so many artists out there that are trying to, to make it in, in their careers and trying to build a career as an artist. And there's so many different paths an artist can go. What advice would you give to the aspiring artist out there that's trying to get to the next level? I would say level? do, study, practice, learn everything you can about what, do you, what you want to play. Um, I mean, instrument-wise, technology-wise, Learn all of it. Do something for. F do something to nurture that every day. Mm -hmm. Take some time every day to get better at every aspect of your of your craft, whether it be playing the instrument, singing, um, mixing, uh, recording, all of that. So the podcast is called Making It. What is your definition of making it? Making it, doing what you love. And paying your bills. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's making it. Well, thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, it. man. My pleasure. Do, do you have any uh, requests from the audience or asks where they, where can they find you so for support the single, Justice? Yeah, you go can go to, um, obviously, you can go to, go find Dumpster Funk on, on Facebook and Instagram, dumpsterfunk.com. And we all have um, our individual Facebook pages that you can come and send us messages and whatnot. But go look up, uh, yeah, Ivan Neville, Ian Neville, Tony Hall, Nick Daniels the third. Um, look us all up, Alvin Ford Jr. And go to dumpsterfunk.com and you can find all of it. You can find out where to find us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And um, support uh, real music. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much cool. again, and I uh, ho hope you. we can do a, a round two one day because I know you have Absolutely. your fullest no, stories and no, love no. to share those with the world. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Before we sign off here, thank you guys again so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Ivan Neville of Dumpster Funk. If you like what you heard, please share this episode with your friends. Subscribe on iTunes. We really appreciate it. If you get a chance, leave us a five-star review. Go to dumpsthefunk.com. Check out the new single, Justice. It's a really good tune featuring one of the New Orleans greats, Trombone Shorty. All things Dumpster Funk are at dumpsthefunk.com. D-U-M-P-S-T-A-P-H-U-N-K. I really appreciate everyone listening. 
appreciate all your support. Thanks for all the kind words on, on social media, text messages, and emails. Love it. Keeping the, the podcast alive, keeping making it with Chris G going, sharing valuable insights and lessons with you guys each and every Thursday. Go to iTunes, subscribe. Thank you. Remember, try new things, be good to people, create good content, and don't stop creating content every single day as much as you can. And in the words of the great Bob Marley, live the life you love. Peace, everybody. Peace.